on what should have been a short and routine test flight on this Dash 7 would soon see the aircraft spiralling towards the ground. On board were two very experienced test pilots, including one who was involved in the original development of the aircraft. Stay tuned to see how this incident unfolded and why it is still puzzling to this day. The aircraft involved in today's incident was a de Havilland Canada Dash 7, built in 1983. Originally delivered new to a Norwegian operator, the aircraft spent its first decade in Scandinavia. In 1996, it was acquired by an Egyptian airline and re-registered there. For about 18 months, it operated in Egypt, but towards the end of that period, the operator faced financial difficulties and the aircraft was grounded. Eventually, the Dash 7 was repossessed by a leasing company, along with a second Dash 7 from the same fleet. Both were ferried to Guernsey, where an engineering company was contracted to restore them to an airworthy condition. The aircraft were re-registered in the Cayman Islands. When this aircraft arrived in Guernsey, it had been sitting idle for some time. Maintenance records from its Egyptian service were incomplete, so engineers decided to repeat the entire maintenance program required for the previous two years. This meant extensive checks and component changes to ensure the aircraft met regulatory standards. By late 1998, this Dash 7 was almost ready to return to service. But before a certificate of airworthiness could be granted, it had to complete a series of functional test flights. For this, two contract test pilots were assigned to fly the Dash 7. The commander, 75 years old, was no ordinary pilot. He had logged approximately 15,000 flight hours, including over 4,000 hours on the Dash 7. More significantly, he had been one of the original experimental test pilots involved in the development of both the Dash 7 and the Dash 8 programs. After retiring from his manufacturer's role, he continued to work for an organization that specialized in ferrying and conducting production test flights on the de Havilland aircraft around the world. The first officer was 66 years old and also brought extensive experience with more than 17,200 total flight hours and around 1,700 hours on the Dash 7. He had worked with the same organization and flown many ferry and test flights with the commander. His recent experience was mainly on the Dash 8, but he had flown the Dash 7s earlier in the year, including ferry flights. Both men held Canadian Airline Transport pilot's licenses validated for the Cayman Islands. Both were considered highly experienced in flight testing and had worked together many times before. Their partnership followed a familiar routine. The commander usually sat in the right-hand seat, where he handled radio communications, engine power settings, and data recording. The first officer in the left-hand seat concentrated on flying the aircraft. This division of tasks was intended to ensure precision during test procedures. On the 25th of November 1998, just three days before this incident flight, the Dash 7 carried out its first post-maintenance test flight in the Channel Islands airspace. That flight was mostly satisfactory, but the crew noted that the aircraft did not meet its required climb performance. The number 3 engine was identified as underpowering and was subsequently replaced. A second, shorter test flight was scheduled for the 28th of November to verify performance after the engine change. Although the flight was authorised under Cayman Island regulations, the aircraft did not yet hold a valid certificate of airworthiness. Strictly speaking, to fly in UK airspace, a special exemption should have been issued by the UK Civil Aviation Authority. No such exemption had been obtained. Nonetheless, the crew elected to perform the test over Devon, where the weather conditions were more favourable than around the Channel Islands. On the day of the accident, weather conditions varied across southern England. Over Guernsey, rain showers and low cloud were reported. Visibility was down to 5,000 metres, with the clouds scattered at 300 feet, broken at 700 feet, and another layer of broken cloud at 1,800 feet. Over Devon, however, the skies were clear with good visibility of 25 kilometres and few cloud between 2,500 feet and 5,000 feet, ideal for flight testing. 
At 0902 local time on the 28th of November 1998, the Dash 7 started engines at Guernsey. The pilots carried out all the relevant checks and run-ups before taxiing to the holding point and stating that they were ready for departure. At 0918, they were cleared for takeoff and with the power levers moved fully forward, the Dash 7 took off en route to Devon. The planned profile was straightforward. Depart Guernsey, climb to flight level 100, then proceed to the Berry Head VOR near the English coast. From there, the aircraft would descend into a block of airspace between flights level 60 and flights level 100 near Plymouth, where the test maneuvers would be performed. The main item on the schedule was a three-engine climb performance test. The procedure required one engine, in this case, the number one engine, which is the engine on the far left from the pilot's perspective, to be shut down and feathered while the other three were set to take off power. The aircraft would then climb for five minutes at V2 speed with the flaps set at 25 degrees. The V2 speed is a takeoff safety speed, which needs to be reached to ensure a safe climb speed if an engine is lost. This is an important speed to be able to reach when below 400 feet, and this V speed varies slightly based on the aircraft weight and the atmospheric conditions. In this instance, the aircraft operating weight was 27,900 pounds, which included the basic weight of the aircraft and the pilots. The fuel load was 10,000 pounds, so its ramp weight was 37,900 pounds. It worked out that after startup, taxi and takeoff, they would use just over 1,000 pounds of fuel, so the V2 speed was worked out to be 81 knots with the flaps at 25 degrees, or 90 knots if the flaps were up. During the test flight, data would be recorded to confirm that the performance met the type's certification standards. With the aircraft in the climb, at 0930, Guernsey Air Traffic Control handed the flight over to London Control. And as the aircraft approached Berry Head at flight level 100, the commander requested descent to flight level 60. Clearance was granted, and at 0943, the Dash 7 checked in with Exeter Air Traffic Control which confirmed its request for the block of airspace between flights level 60 and flights level 100. For clarity, this meant that the aircraft could freely operate between 6,000 and 10,000 feet on the standard pressure setting. The controller vectored the aircraft northbound to keep it clear of Plymouth traffic. The crew then requested a descent to flights level 50, which was also approved, and their block altitude was amended, now 5,000 feet to 10,000 feet. By this stage, they were configuring for the performance climb test. The number one engine was shut down and feathered. However, the required step of selecting flaps to 25 degrees was not carried out. The flaps remained fully retracted. With the autopilot engaged, the aircraft leveled at flight level 50. The commanding pilots reduced the power to a low power setting required for the test, with the three remaining engines providing power. The airspeed gradually bled off and the autopilot trimmed further nose up to maintain altitude. This was quite a substantial amount of nose trim and should have been noticed by the crew. It may have been interpreted as manual trim put on by the handling pilot and dismissed as such. The speed continued to decrease in accordance with the test, but at about 97 knots, the Dash 7 entered a pre-stall buffet. The autopilot was still engaged and may have masked some of the warning signs for the crew. The stick shaker then would have activated around this speed, which will warn the pilots of the impending stall. But it appears that no action was taken with the activation of the stick shaker. The autopilots on this aircraft can only be disengaged by the pilots. So if the stick shaker was operating, the autopilot would remain engaged. The speed continued to decrease until at 89 knots, the aircraft stalled. The autopilot was still connected and the nose trim remained in. The crew then advanced the power levers forward, causing the three live engines to increase power. Two seconds later, the autopilot was disconnected. At this point, the aircraft rolled sharply to the left, reaching 80 degrees of bank, and pitched nose down to 54 degrees. The handling pilot immediately input right spoiler and rudder to combat the forces acting on the aircraft. The roll angle decreased, and with the extreme nose-down attitude, 
the pilots reduced the power on the engines. The controls were then moved into the fully nose up position. And this is where the mystery of this event unfolds. The aircraft either enters a spin or a spiral dive. Both are two very different events that required different actions to solve them. The aircraft was stalled and the elevator demand for pitch up and the nose up trim maintained the wings in a stalled position. The pilots continued to fight the issues that were facing them. The power was reduced on the engines, which assisted with the reduction in asymmetric thrust, and with the nose down, the speed would be expected to increase. The elevator remained in the full nose up position and the right rudder was fully pressed. The spoiler control varied in an attempt to manage the roll rate of the aircraft. Witnesses on the ground saw the aircraft descending in a spiral or spin-like motion, engines roaring, and some compared it to a falling leaf. The flight data recorder showed yaw rates up to 60 degrees per second, steep attitudes, and a descent rate of more than 10,000 feet per minute. At 0947, Exeter Air Traffic Control noticed the aircraft descending through flight level 47 and attempted to contact the crew warning them of the terrain. No reply was received, and seconds later, radar returns disappeared entirely. In the aircraft, they continued to descend towards the ground, actively trying to correct the upset position, but it wasn't enough in time. The Dash 7 crashed on the southern slopes of Dartmoor, near Ashburton, in Devon, at an elevation of about 500 feet above sea level. The aircraft struck the ground, nose down, left wing low, rotating rapidly. A fire broke out immediately, destroying much of the wreckage, and both pilots were killed instantly. Despite the fire damage, investigators from the UK Air Accidents Investigation Branch were able to piece together the sequence of events using the flight's data recorder, which had survived. The key findings included that the aircraft was structurally complete before impact and there was no in-flight breakup. The number one engine was correctly feathered and shut down. The flaps were retracted, not at 25 degrees as required for the test. The autopilots remained engaged through the stall, trimming the nose up, and the crew applied asymmetric power at the stall, leading directly to loss of control. Medical examinations found no evidence of pilot incapacitation, drugs or alcohol. Both men held valid medical certificates. One crucial piece of evidence was missing, the cockpit voice recorder. It was found to have failed some time earlier, possibly during the aircraft service in Egypt. As a result, no audio from the accident flight was available, leaving investigators unable to determine what the pilot said or noticed during the critical moments. One part that is acknowledged in the investigation, but not paid enough attention to, in my opinion, is the analysis of the forces acting on the controls after the deactivation of the autopilot. This was tested in the simulator after the event. It was found that over 30 pounds of force would be required to maintain level after the autopilot was disconnected as the aircraft was trimmed heavily nose up. That force, plus the asymmetric thrust created by the three engines on a slow aircraft, puts the pilots in a very difficult position. It is worth noting that the pilots were a little older so although they were very experienced, which was proven in their actions, perhaps they were not as strong as they once were, leading to a delayed reaction to the event. When it comes to the spin or spiral descent, the eyewitness describes the fall of the aircraft to that of a leaf, which would suggest a spin. Within the flight's data recorded during the descent, speeds of 30 knots were recorded, which also supports this. However, the initial roll and nose down pitch of 54 degrees, along with the pilot's control input to a full nose up demand, suggest disorientation due to a spiral descent, or a mix of the two, perhaps in the early stages of the incident. Without all the data, it is difficult to know, but due to the experience of the pilots, their actions recorded on the flight data recorder are unusual and provide more questions than answers. The Air Accidents Investigation Branch concluded that the accident resulted from a chain of factors. The incorrect configuration of the aircraft, as the crew didn't set flaps to 25 degrees. With the flaps retracted, the stall speed was higher, leaving less margin during the deceleration. 
As the autopilot continued to trim the nose up as the aircraft slowed, it marks the start of the stall. There was also a delayed response. Despite the stick shaker activation, the crew did not promptly disconnect the autopilot or take corrective action. And the application of power, which was at the stall, power was increased on the three operating engines. This asymmetric thrust caused the aircraft to roll and yaw uncontrollably. The Air Accidents Investigation Branch noted that both pilots were highly experienced and their lack of effective response to the stick shaker was unusual. Distraction or miscommunication could not be ruled out and the absence of the cockpit voice recorder meant that their reasoning would never be known. The investigation highlighted deficiencies in flight recording requirements. Because this aircraft was operating in a private category under Cayman Islands registration, it was not legally required to carry recorders. The only reason data was available was that the aircraft had been fitted with recorders during its earlier airline service. The investigation branch recommended that the UK Civil Aviation Authority amend its regulations to require all aircraft over 5,700 kilograms, regardless of category, to carry flight recorders. It also urged ICAO to raise the recommended practices to mandatory standards for this weight class. It is worth noting that test flights do not occur without the knowledge of a little extra risk. Test pilots are trained with this in mind and are prepared should the aircraft behave in an unusual manner. Research in this incident was interesting but also confusing at times. Something occurred, a distraction, complacency, a fault that wasn't discovered which led to this accident. The fact that the flaps were left up was maybe a sign that the crew were distracted. That, along with the masking effect of the autopilot, may answer why this event led to disaster. Or perhaps not. I look forward to seeing what you think about it. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.